So, um, you can click it and then you may don't see your picture that time. Mm -hmm. So I'll just start by introducing myself. I'm Matt Slaughter. I'm the owner and director of Earthfort in Corvallis, Oregon. And we're primarily a soil microbiology testing laboratory. And we've been, um, I've been working with soil microbiology since about 2003, working with the lab. I've had the pleasure of traveling to many, many places in the world, helping people fix their soils for many different reasons, usually in an agricultural setting. You know, so the, so the devastation of these fires is um, <laughs> unique in their, uh, you know, character of how they've, how they've affected the soil. So hopefully we'll cover, cover some of that and look at some, uh, some different strategies for helping to fix those problems that the, uh, that the fires created. The, um, I think the idea is I'm just going to talk. Um, it probably, hopefully it'll only take about 45 minutes to get through the presentation and then we'll have a lot of time for some questions and answers um, at the end. Uh, we'll set up the chat and you guys can unmute yourselves or whatnot and we can try and get questions answered uh, at the end. So I do recommend that you maybe take notes as we go so that you'll, uh, you'll know the questions. And there'll also be contact information. Um, you can get a hold of me directly afterwards as well if you have other questions. So with that, you know, I don't, uh, don't have much else to say about myself, so I'm just going to keep going. And the, um, you know, the, the concepts that we're going to be talking about is, um, you know, really how do we restore a, a system or a, a, an ecology, a soil, to a state of health and function after, you know, a fairly major thing. But one thing I do want to say that's very important about uh, this whole process is that in some cases fire is good. Um, I know, you know, the loss of a home, the loss of uh, life is not a pleasant thing to deal with. Um, but as far as the soil is concerned, in many cases, it's, it's actually a beneficial thing for the soil as we, as we look at these processes that affect the soil, because that, those natural processes can help guide us to how to um, basically restore that system, restore that ecology. And so when we look at a natural process, you know, the ebb and flow of life is, is always happening. There's never any, there's nothing static about nature. And so when we look at what this is, you know, this natural system, you know, fire is part of that natural system. But we'll talk about more, more of that as we go. So just um, some key concepts that I just want to make sure that we touch on as we go through this information and I kind of set the stage and then we'll talk, a, we'll look at some examples and then we'll talk about different remediation strategies. So one thing that's really important in all of this, and, and I've seen the document that outlines the heavy metals testing that's required um, based on the size of the uh, area that you're working with. And I, I wholeheartedly agree with making sure you test those things. But other testing that can be really helpful is to test the life. What is currently still alive in that soil? How badly damaged is it? Because, you know, that can really help guide some strategies. You know, in some areas, the, you know, may be very, very damaged. And in other areas, it may be very superficial. Um, you know, so not only knowing the heavy metals, but also the life, the biology, and then also nutrient, like almost more like a standard um, agriculture or even a plant available nutrient test can also help guide the process of restoring these soils because, you know, we might have to think about, is there some fertility requirements? We know a lot of the organic matter was destroyed. 
we know a lot of the life in the soil was, was put out of balance. So the other key principle, and this ties into the testing, you know, trying things to fix the problem is great, but if you can't test it, if you cannot monitor and determine whether or not a particular strategy or a particular approach is working, then it's probably not completely useful uh, to try and do it. Because I know part of the goal in all of this is to find strategies that people can duplicate. And if you can't monitor it somehow and keep track of what was done and what the outcome was in some meaningful way, then it's impossible to replicate. It's impossible to communicate that success to somebody else if you don't have that information. So, you know, it's, it's important to keep that in mind. You know, you may try things, but if they, you know, and you may be successful in some areas and that may be all you can say is that, you know, I tried this thing and something positive happened and that's a one way to monitor it. So it's just important to keep in mind. Also, um, the, uh, you know, while you're working on the individual pieces of your project, you're looking at your property, you're looking at different pastures, you're looking at different, you know, different areas that are trying to be restored, working with different types of plants and things. Keep the whole system and the whole process in mind while you're working on those parts. Because sometimes, you know, you might, you might come up with a strategy to fix one area and you forget about some other section and there may be, as they say, downstream consequences. Um, so it's just, a, just more of a mindset to just kind of keep the whole property and the whole perspective in mind while you're working on the parts. And, um, and this one's really important. Life first. This is all about life. Life in the soil, restoring the life to the plants, restoring the life to, the, to your personal ecosystem and also to the regional ecosystem that you're working with. It's all about life. So everything has to be focused on restoring the life in that area. Every, anything else is kind of secondary. So even the heavy metals, the only thing that we're interested in is, is there too much that might hinder life? Or is there, you know, if we're looking at the life itself, is there enough, is it in balance? You know, and the same with a fertility, is there enough fertility to help the plants grow? So it's always about life first. And then the final principle, and I'll, I'll beat this one a lot because it's, it's really important. Always be focused on solving problems, not just treating the symptoms. You know, it's great to, you know, put a Band-Aid on something. You know, I know, um, you know, there's nothing we can do about the requirements that the state has put on you for removal of topsoil. Um, that's just the way they have decided to do it. But that's solving a symptom, and it's not actually addressing problems because they have not identified that there's actual problems. They're just telling you, to remove topsoil without without doing the testing, um, and and for me personally, the way we approach things is that's that's backwards. You know, find out what's wrong and then actually address the problem and solve for the problem, not just the symptoms. So that's just um, just some some key concepts that uh, hopefully you can keep in mind as we're going through all of this information, and some of it will get pretty detailed and. Some of it, some of it's pretty broad. So I know you've done, um, a lot of you probably participated in an earlier webinar uh, where the, uh, uh, talking about ecological succession and, and how, how that works. And so I just wanted to bring this up just to kind of reiterate that point that, you know, plant communities move back and forth through this idea of ecological succession fire is considered a secondary succession event. Of course, that can vary depending on the intensity of the fire. But for the most part, it's superficial to the soil. Um, there may be some damage, some of the plants, you know, especially trees, a lot of trees probably don't die 
Um, you know, but again, it's all about intensity. You know, some areas were pretty intense. The trees died, the roots burned down into the ground and had a tremendous impact on, on the whole below ground part of it. But our goal is to take you from whatever the fire damage was, and that's why testing is so important. Where are you based on succession? That's where the biology comes in. Where are you based on fertility? And where are you based on actual contaminants that may hinder that progress? So all of that testing comes in to determine how and where do you need to be on the succession chart. You know, if you're trying to restore a pine forest, you know, it's gonna take a lot of fungi. And if you left nature to do it on its own, it could take a while to restore those forests um, you know, but if it's grassland, pasture lands, it may not take as much work. Um, again, it's all dependent upon how the testing came out and how badly damaged the soil are. So, you know, I know a lot of people think that their soils have become sterilized because of the fire, but actually that may not be completely true. Um, so, you know, in case in point is, you know, some of the, you know, not to bring up, uh, any kind of painful memories or anything, but when the fires burned in uh, Yellowstone, you know, and I was just there uh, this fall, some sections, and this is a long time, this is what, from the 80s or 90s, you know, when they burned, some sections of Yellowstone are still barely recovering. In other sections, you can't even tell that there was a fire went through there. Um, you know, other than, you know, oh, there's a burnt stump amongst all of this new growth and the trees, some of the trees didn't get completely killed and they re recovered. Um, others, other areas, you know, it just didn't work. So the whole point here is, is that it, it, fire is all a matter of degree, huh, pun intended, where we go, we go through this whole spectrum. So, in some cases it's bad, some cases it's not so bad, but you don't know until you get some testing to, to verify where you're at. Because if you just take seed or buy a bunch of pine trees and dig a hole and put it in the ground and expect them to grow after a fire, you may or may not be successful. So that's where we'll talk about some of the tools and things that you can do to help make it work. But first, I just want to talk about um, talk about some other things, um, you know, in regards to the testing, you know, and just kind of cover that real briefly. So, you know, and also talk about the testing that we do because I feel like if you want to be successful in restoring the soil, we focus on the life and we get the life in place. And you'll see when I review the examples of some of the work we've done. We're focusing on the life actually can solve some problems that, that a lot of people didn't think was possible to, to solve. Um, so this is testing that we do, and we look at bacteria populations, fungal populations, and protozoa populations. We also look at nematodes, but for the sake of uh, time, I'm not going to cover that <clears throat> for today. So, um, yeah, just uh, <clears throat> just going to talk about some of the work we do. So, just to keep moving on here, the sorry, there we go. Um, yeah, this is going to go pretty good. So the everything we do is direct microscopy. So we take a soil sample and we prepare it in the lab we dilute it and then we put it on a slide and we actually count the microorganisms that we find in the soil. So we're talking about uh, a method of direct examination. You know, if you can measure it, you can manage it. That's one of the old mantras, right? That's, that's from, that's old school stuff. Um, we can determine the biomass and the balance of that biology, tell you how well it's functioning and then move into, um, different strategies to help correct it. And it's all based on the, the balance of those microorganisms, based on the plant, based on the season that you're growing, 
the plant or the season that you're looking at it. So like right now it'd be, we're looking at early spring strategies, you know, um, not just damaged soils, but also it's spring. So what kind of things would we need to do to facilitate not only repairing that life, but also how do we get it where it needs to be for a spring like environment. So this is our fancy differential interference contrast epifluorescent compound microscope. Woo, what a mouthful, huh? So this is our this is our baby. And what we see in the microscope is, you know, the life. So this is all bacteria. This is a bacteria colony sitting there. And all of the individual dots are, um, let's see, whoops. All of the individual dots, I'm gonna pull up a laser pointer here. Um, they, um, you know, so this is the a colony of bacteria. All of these individual dots are, are bacteria. And the, and the technicians actually count these. And then once we've counted them, we can convert them uh, using special formulas to biomass. So we get micrograms per gram of soil of bacteria. Now, I just want to touch briefly on the role of bacteria because I think it's really important to not only know that we're counting it, but to understand why. So bacteria is, you know, it's got three basic simple functions. The first one is, is it's a nutrient collector. Uh, there's basically no known naturally occurring substance on earth that there isn't a bacteria that is known to eat it. So there's some man-made stuff that we're, they're still trying to figure out, but naturally occurring elements and uh, chemicals uh, are eaten by bacteria. And when they do that, they eat the mineral component of the soil, they break down these different compounds, they break down organic matter, and they store those nutrients, basically, in their bodies as protein. And then that becomes the first stage in what we call a natural nutrient cycle. And the bacteria are essentially little fertilizer bags. And I know you've probably heard that before, but they're, they're essentially, they're just collecting. The other thing they do, when you look at these colonies, you know, this is what we would call microaggregation. They actually start the process of building soil structure. So they produce alkaline glues to help them break down the components in the soil and allows them to eat it. And then they can, they bind themselves together. They bind themselves to the sand, silt and clay and to the, and to the organic matter. And it starts the process of aggregation. So the third thing, I already kind of mentioned it, was the alkaline component. And, and these are very broad general rules. Um, you know, we look at it from a very high level. We're not getting into the specific functionality of any individual bacteria, but as a, as a group, as a whole, their role in the soil is to produce alkaline conditions. And it um, ties into the succession information. Plants that like alkaline soil conditions tend to be plants that also like bacterial dominated soils. So for example, broccoli, very alkaline plant, all the mustards, uh, a lot of our lettuces and kales and things like that. Those are all alkaline loving plants and they also happen to be very bacterial when it comes to the, the predominant uh, organism in the soil that lives in their root system. So bacteria, just to repeat, collect nutrients, stick the components of the soil together and produce alkaline conditions. So they have a profound impact on the overall pH of the soil. And not the overall pH of the soil, but specifically the pH in the root system of the plant. So right in the rhizosphere. And part of, the, uh, part of the information that's going to be put together as a package um, with uh, references and papers and things to support everything I'm saying today is a paper on the rhizosphere pH um, research that was done that shows that right in the root system, the biology, 
bacteria, and we'll talk about fungi as well, but bacteria can change the pH of the soil in the root system by plus or minus two points on the pH scale, which is, which is pretty extreme. So, so that's the function of bacteria. Now the last bit that we do when we're looking at the, uh, at the bacteria is we also add a special stain into the sample that binds with some of the proteins in the organism and it causes it to glow green under our microscope and what we're measuring is aerobic activity. So not only can we determine the total population, but we can also determine how much of that population is metabolizing oxygen. We call that active. And so that information tells us not only how much bacteria we have, but how well is it working? Is it a truly aerobic system? You know, do you have enough oxygen and enough food source for those bacteria to work that way? So that's bacteria. Now I'm gonna talk about or fungi. Fungi are the filamentous strands that um, live in the soil. A lot of people, you know, I mean, you know, realistically what you're talking about is uh, mushrooms, is all mushrooms are fungi, but not all fungi produce mushrooms. But, uh, you know, these filamentous strands that become, when they bind together, they create mycelium and then they create, then they can create mushrooms. But what we're interested in is that microscopic component of the um, uh, fungi in the soil. And these, these filamentous strands you can see is all kinds of different shapes and colors. And one thing that's obvious when you look at this image is that, you know, part of their job is structure. So they're also doing exactly the same kind of work that the bacteria are doing. They just do it differently, but they're also responsible for macro aggregation in the soil as opposed to micro aggregation. So they can bind together the bacteria, the clumps of the bacteria create in bigger pieces of organic matter and start building up better soil structure as well. The sponge-like qualities of a soil are directly and almost exclusively related to the fungal population. You can't have a good, spongy, healthy, well-aggregated, well-structured soil without fungi. It's just, it's just not, you just can't do it. Um, you need that fungal component. Now fungi, again, they eat everything, they break it down, they store all these nutrients in their bodies, and um, the difference between bacteria and fungi though, other than the obvious, the look of them, is um, they do their job by producing organic acids to break down all of these different components. So their role in the soil is to create a lower soil pH. They produce acidic conditions. And you know, when we look, again, when we look at plants, if you're looking at a pine tree, pine trees love acid soils. They also love fungally dominated soils. So there's, there's a, a connection between bacteria and fungi balance in the soil, plant needs, and it all has to do with the nutrient cycle, right? The different nutrients are available at different pHs, different forms of nutrients. And so the microorganisms are kind of responsible for working with the plant roots to create those conditions that allow the nutrients to be available to the plant in forms that the plant wants. But in order to really achieve that, the balance has to be there. Now, I'm not gonna talk about mycorrhizal fungi in this session just for time. It's, um, we have a lot, uh, there's more information to cover, but just briefly, mycorrhizal fungi is one small subset of a total fungal population that colonizes the roots of the plants. And in some cases, that's really critical. So when we're working with trees, absolutely have to have mycorrhizal, especially ectomycorrhizal with their firs and our pines and things like that. Um, deciduous trees like endomycorrhizal. Uh, a lot of our grasses, you know, pasture grasses, even our row crops, things like that. They don't really care <laughs> one way or the other. If you can make the soil condition good, then um, you don't necessarily need mycorrhizal and those plants could care less. 
And then some plants don't want it at all. Uh, again, the brassicas, the uh, mustard family, the, the leafy vegetables, things like that, they don't really want mycorrhizal. In fact, they even create things around the root system to limit the access of mycorrhizal to the roots. So, but that's, you know, getting into a lot of detail. So, but as part of the overall profile, we can measure for that as well. We look at the roots of the plant um, to, uh, to determine what's going on. So just, just quickly too about fungi, you know, when we measure the fungi, this is again, this is just straight out of our microscope. We're measuring the length of the fungi, we're averaging the diameter so that we can then convert it also to biomass. So we can compare bacteria and fungi and the relative balance. So, um, you know, it's, it's really important for that initial basic test. And that's what we call our basic test is the bacteria and fungi. What are those populations? How active are they? And what's the balance? That's our basic test. Now, for the most part, bacteria and fungi don't actually feed plants. So we need another player in the game of, um, let's see if I can get it, there we go. Um, we need protozoa. Now, this is a testate amoeba, you know, and there's, there's flagellates and different types of amoebas. There's also ciliates. Um, there's three, those are the three major functional groups. Again, we, we pull the sample, we prepare it, and, and we examine and count these organisms to determine their population. And their job is predators. So they eat the bacteria, they eat the fungi, some of them eat each other, you know, they, they, like, to, they like to eat things. Uh, most of us are familiar with protozoa, you know, have heard of Montezuma's revenge, right? Um, amoebic dysentery. Um, that's one type of protozoa that lives in water. If you happen to drink it and don't have the enzymes to protect yourself, it produces a toxin and it can make you sick. Yay, but that's not the kind of protozoa that we're working with in the soil. What we're working with in the soil is these true aerobic organisms that are eating the bacteria and fungi and they literally poop out plant available nutrients. Well, let me take a step back. It's not plant available. They release soluble nutrients. Now, you know, we use nitrogen as an example because that's what most people are familiar with. Protozoa release free ammonia. When they eat, they eat the bacteria, they eat the fungi, and they get all this nutrient. And what happens is that the, uh, this gets a little technical, this is the biochemical process, but you know, a bacteria has a C to N ratio, carbon to nitrogen ratio of five to one. Protozoa has a C to N ratio of 30 to one. So in order to be fed, that protozoa has to eat six bacteria. Well, he gets his 30 carbon, but now he's got six nitrogen. What does he do with it? Well, it becomes waste. It's just like the cows. They eat grass. They are not 100% efficient at pulling all the nutrients out of the grass, so there's some waste, and it becomes poop. Um, easy, right? It's the same thing at the microscopic level with these grazers as they consume. And the, the thing that happens is that that ammonia is released by the protozoa. That's the soluble form of nitrogen. But that ammonia doesn't stay ammonia for very long. Depending on conditions in the soil, it will get converted into another form. So, and this is an oversimplification of an incredibly complex biochemical process. But the simple version is, in an alkaline soil, it gets converted into nitrate. Nitrate is a form that plants love when they're trying to push vegetative growth. In an acidic soil or slightly acidic soil, then you get ammonium created from that ammonia. And ammonium is what our um, plants that are producing seed, are producing fruit, producing wood, uh, that's the form of nitrogen that, that those kind of plants like. You know, also has to do with C3 and C4 plants, but we won't, we won't get into that. That's, that's a whole nother, whole nother webinar. Um, but the, um, 
But the point is, is that these nutrients are released into the soil. Now, that's assuming that the soil is properly balanced, that the pH is appropriate for the plant, and that there's adequate oxygen and uh, moisture in the soil. So what happens if there's not? That's when we start running into trouble. This is why um, it's so important to get the biology balanced in the soil and get it working, because if it's broken, we call it broken dirt, um, it's anaerobic, it's no oxygen, or um, it's extremely alkaline or extremely acidic, or um, it's waterlogged or too dry. There's all kinds of different things that contribute to a not healthy environment. That ammonia gets converted into all kinds of other interesting things that our plants don't want. Uh, could be released straight off as ammonia. And you've experienced that when you get a big pile of cow or horse manure and it's just sitting there and waiting for nature to happen. It's losing a lot of ammonia. You can smell it. Um, that's, that's an anaerobic condition where it's sustained, you know, basically it's not getting converted. So it's usually considered anaerobic. Could be released as nitrous oxide or straight as N2 gas, depends on what the conversions are. If it's truly anaerobic, um, you know, it could be NO2. The most likely case though, is that it gets converted into nitrite. And nitrite is not exactly a, the best form of nitrogen for plants to grow, but there are certain types of plants that do like nitrite. And I'd, I'll let you guess what those are. Um, if you were in person, I'd have people raising their hands, but basically um, it's what we call early successional plants or pioneer plants. Um, some other people call them weeds. I don't like the term weeds because that has a broader connotation um, as far as a plant out of place. So I like, to, I like early successional plants. These pioneer species are designed to grow in soils that are in bad shape. So after a fire, what comes in first? You know, just through natural processes without having to try and do anything. You get a lot of a lot of broadleaf stuff. You get nettles. You get um, you know all kinds of things that you don't really want to grow, um, but they're designed to grow. You know uh, dandelions, for example. That all these types of plants, the annual grasses, especially the really low quality annual grasses, <laughs> um, they're designed to grow in these poor soil conditions, and that's their job. So that nitrite is available to those plants. Part of the reason why those plants are not very favorable is only because they don't have a high nutrient content to feed our animals. Um, you know, and they interfere with or steal the nutrients from our primary plants that we're trying to work with. That's a little bit of a mis misnomer. Um, they're not stealing anything. It's just the conditions are favoring their success over over a, a perennial grass or over a, a tree, um, you know. So that's why it's so important to get this biology balanced and working right. And, you know, the first step is testing and then there's, you know, looking at, um, you know, ways to help fix that problem, which we'll get to. So that's, um, I, you know, I don't have a picture of the nematodes because I figured I didn't have much time, but, you know, I'm doing pretty good. Uh, with time, but the nematode is the microscopic worms that live in the soil. They um, are also predators. They're a little more specialized than the protozoa, so there's bacterial feeders, specific bacterial feeders, there's fungal feeders, uh, there's predatory nematodes, and their job is to eat root feeding nematodes and other things, insects, other protozoa, whatever they can get in their mouth, pretty much, they're omnivorous. But, um, you know, so these nematodes, these microscopic worms live in the soil and they're doing very similar work to the protozoa. They're also, because they're so large, they're so much larger than, than protozoa and certainly than the bacteria. Um, they, they help with uh, creating micro porous spaces within the soil profile as well. So they're really helpful in with structure of the soil as well. 
helping open it up and that helps air and water move through it. And these are much smaller than like earthworms. We're not talking about earthworms. We're talking about basically you, you can't, you can barely see some of them with the naked eye. Most of them have to be looked at under the microscope. But, uh, and most people are terrified of root feeding nematodes, but you know, that's, that's mostly for uh, commercial row crops and things like that. They're all part of the natural system. So when we look at all of this together, we look at the bacteria, we look at the fungi, we look at the protozoa populations, we can look at nematode populations, and we, and we look at it as a whole, and then we kind of overlay that against what you're trying to grow, what you're trying to achieve, um, you know, where are you currently and where do you need to be? And that's where, you know, coming up with some strategies can be really, really helpful to find ways to do that. Now, I just want to touch briefly on the soil nutrient um, component, you know, uh, macro elements, just the NPK, you know, how that's for fertilizer type of information. You know, do I have enough macronutrients to kind of help grow my plants? Is it in an adequate level? Micronutrients are really important for, um, you know, proper plant growth. Also, if you're growing food crops, having good micronutrient uh, available and, and in a good level in the soil so that the biology can eat it and release it, you know, that can be really helpful for things like taste and nutrient density and quality. And that is, you know, the same for blueberries it is, as it is for forage, as it is for silage. Um, and then there's all the trace minerals. Um, you know, those are a little trickier to measure and manage, um, but it's, uh, you know, can be really important to know if things are really out of whack, maybe trace minerals can be helpful. But most of the time, you know, the one thing I didn't say, and this is important when you're looking at soil nutrients, all of the nutrients that you'll ever need to feed any plant you want already exist in your soil. The problem is getting them from the mineral stage to a form that the plant can utilize. And that's where the biology comes in. And so biology is critical to nutrient availability. Current agricultural practices, horticultural practices are kind of designed to, we put down fertilizers in large quantities to kind of force the plants to grow. <laughs> you know, a lot of that is a salt uh, based type of nutrient and those salts force their way into the plant. But when you do that, it's almost exclusively looking at the macro nutrients um, very little micro and trace uh, components, and it makes for a potentially, you know, hollow, um, a hollow plant. So, but if you incorporate the biology, then all of a sudden these things can, A, fertilizers become more efficient, and, um, and you actually start getting more of, the, um, more of that trace and micronutrients into the plant as well. Now with heavy metals, you know, that's kind of a whole different realm um, of testing and uh, requirements. You know, heavy metals are, are part of the system. They do have, um, you know, they can be very inhibitive of life if we don't, if we don't manage for them. Now, um, I've seen, like I said, I've seen the requirements for cleanup. And um, I don't necessarily agree, and you'll see why when we go through some of the some of the examples that I have. But you know, it is what it is. So you know, you got to deal with losing a lot of your topsoil. So that means you're losing a lot of organic matter, you're losing a lot of life, and any of the macro and micronutrients that had already been pulled out of the soil by the biology will also be lost because most of the activity of the biology is right in the top six inches of the soil. So if you're taking off four to six inches of soil, it's, it's kind of rough. But fortunately, it, it's not so bad. I mean, in the overall scheme of things, and we certainly um, have ways of, of compensating for that, um, for that loss. So anyways, so that's, you know, 
do the heavy metal testing, do macro and micronutrient testing. Um, trace minerals is probably not worth testing. We like to test for um, plant available nutrients and that's a test that we offer. And it's looking at those macro and micronutrients from the perspective of uh, root zone interactions. How does the, the root, how does a plant see those nutrients? So it's a very different extraction process to look at that soil. And it basically, it's, it lies somewhere between um, the, uh, you know, most people are used to seeing exchangeable, the CEC uh, testing, that's melic threes and things like that. The little moderate extraction, some of it's a little harsh extraction of the soil. And that's the component that's on the surface of the sand, silt, and clay. So that's the cation exchange capacity. And then of course there's soluble nutrients. What is actually in the soil solution soluble in water? And, and again, those aren't necessarily, those are not plant available nutrients. Those are just what could become plant available given that the conditions are right or not. And then the smallest component is that plant available. So we're looking at, you know, if you look at a pyramid, we're looking at the very top of the pyramid of, um, of all the nutrients that are in the soil. We're looking at this tiny fraction, you know, and when we do that, the biggest advantage to that is, is that we always incorporate that information with our biological profile. And then when we make fertility recommendations, it's tiny amounts, you know. Uh, so for example, a lot of people, you know, they'll get a report back that says either you're deficient in lime or a calcium, or the pH is not appropriate for your plants. So you need to put lime down to, to fix it. And, you know, anywhere from one to two tons per acre is often the recommendation for lime. Uh, we usually, at the most, will recommend maybe 50 pounds of lime, and we only ever look at actual calcium deficiency when we're doing that. We don't try and adjust the pH through chemistry. Uh, that's really expensive and hard to do. Um, obviously, everybody tries to do it, but it's at, at an extreme cost sometimes. So we don't... So we use small amounts, we like micro doses. You know, we also often will recommend like a foliar feeding as opposed to uh, an actual just dumping soil on or fertilizer on the ground. So anyways, those are some of the testing that I recommend. Biology, of course, getting some fertility information in addition to the heavy metals testing. So, so that's some testing. So now I'm gonna talk about some uh, examples of projects that we've done. Now, some of these projects are anecdotal. <laughs> um, just, they're just experience and they're one-offs. Um, two, a, a few of them are actual ongoing and, um, and two of them are really well documented. One through Oregon State University and one through Dr. Karen Gardner um, and I'll talk about each of them as we go. So I want to start with the uh, I want to start with this one because this one is kind of close to home and is dealing with very similar issues that you're, you're dealing with there in uh, in those fire devastated areas. So this was a medical waste dump in India, southern India. It's right outside of a hospital. They dumped everything into the field and burned it. They burned the plastic. They burned all of the everything. <laughs> okay. We don't need to get too gross. They burned everything. Um, they, when they decided to clean it up, they, they did a bunch of testing, and I don't have any of the data, so this is, this is very anecdotal. Uh, Peter Ash is the person who did this. I have some references and, and things to for people who are interested in pursuing this information a little bit more with him, we can put you in contact. But what Peter did was he went in um, and looked at this situation. They Obviously, they put out the fire. They cleaned out the plastic the best they could. They tested for heavy metals, and it was a really high level of heavy metals. So they started a phytoremediation program rather than removing all of the topsoil because they had no place to put it right there's there's just no place for it to really go 
Um, they started, uh, they thought, well, let's get plants in there, hyperaccumulate the heavy metals, dispose of the plants in a more appropriate way. Um, you know, it's easier to dispose of plant material that's contaminated than the actual soil. And so, so they planted this garden. Um, all kinds of different things are growing in this garden. And they, um, they figured it would take three to five years to clean up this area, get the heavy metals cleaned up and really help rebuild the soil. They, um, what they did was, uh, because it's India, rural India, uh, Peter taught them how to make uh, worm compost, so vermicompost, and then he taught them how to turn it into a liquid, uh, a tea, um, liquefying it, and very simple. It's a very simple uh, approach. They did use some. Uh, they did use some of the products that we sell um, a couple times early on. They used some soil revive. I'll talk about that, which is basically a humic acid um, product. That, that helps with the overall process. But they added worm compost to this thing, they planted these plants, and then they just started treating it, spraying it with the compost tea. And, and the worm compost and the compost tea is all about the life. Uh, you make compost and it's all full of biology, it's basically like a soil. It, it breaks everything down, all of this wonderful, through the gut of the worm and everything, create this really biologically rich material then you can take uh, that substrate, liquefy it and spray biology out on it. it. Makes it for a really nice way to start introducing and restoring the biology. Now, like I said, three to five years was their goal. After two years, and this area was fenced off so that was, nobody could get into it, but after two years, the fruit was looking really good. Um, the plants were growing really great everything, you know, and people started sneaking into the garden and stealing the food and eating it. And of course, Peter panicked um, because he was afraid that all that fruit had, would have the heavy metals in it and that they'd get sick. So and, and he called me and said, oh, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And I, I told him to test the fruit, test the plants and test the fruit see what level of heavy metals is in it and try and figure out, you know, and if it is high, then, you know, communicate that to people, build a bigger fence, I don't know, or cut them down. Don't grow fruit trees until the system is cleaned up. So he went and tested it and only after two years, all the heavy metals were gone. He tested the soil, he tested the plants, he tested the fruit. There was no detectable heavy metals in this system after only two years of a very simple rural application of, of managing soil microbiology. Um, three years into it, they opened the garden up for use and now they even tested the nutrient density of this food. It is reserved for cancer patients and for children in the hospital because it is the best tasting and most nutrient dense food in the whole area. So, Pretty amazing to think that from a medical waste dump to three years being the best food you can get in the area. Um, and that's, you know, part of this idea is the resiliency of life. Um, if you take care of it, it, it's amazing what can happen, you know, in a very short period of time, you know, and not necessarily very complicated. Now, that's a lot of work, and this is a fairly small area. I don't think it was more than a few hundred square meters of, of space. So I don't, I think it was like half the size of a football field or something like that. So this is pretty small space, um, pretty easy to manage. Now the cool thing though is of course, Peter took this success and he goes around and he teaches other villages in India how to do this stuff so that they can create, um, so that they don't have to have these kind of dumps and they can, they can do a better job of taking care of it. And so they were properly managing the plastic and they have a much smaller burn pile for only the things that need to be burned. And it's a much more controlled kind of a setting. So anyways, Peter's great. I love Peter, he's my hero. So that's, that's one example of what can happen. And again, this is anecdotal. 
Um, it's not it's not documented. There was no research paper written on this. Um, there's uh, I've, I've seen the results of the testing. Peter shared that with me, but this was been a while, and I don't think I have those anymore. We'd have to contact Peter and see if he still has that info. But um, but pretty good stuff. So that's just one example. Now, here's another example. This is a little closer to home. So Vashon Island is in the um, Puget Sound region of Washington, just outside of Seattle. And um, this, <laughs> this island and a whole section of that area was uh, downwind from an old smelting plant. And all of the waste and smog and everything coming downwind from the smelting plant contaminated their soils with arsenic and high levels of arsenic. Now in the rural, in the residential areas, the state went in and basically cleaned three feet of soil out around every single house on the island and replaced it with new topsoil. Basically got rid of the arsenic that way. But in the forested areas, they just left it alone and they didn't do anything with it. So uh, Dr. Gardner, Karen, she contacted us and said, well, I want to see if we can do a simple way to clean up the arsenic in the forest without, you know, having to go in and, and remove it because we're worried that it's just going to keep creeping back into our, um, our residential areas. So she picked an acre of forest um, and tested it in the fall for uh, the micrograms per gram of arsenic in the soil. And um, so you can see those two, the control was 57, the treated was 82. That was the starting point. She put down a gallon and a pound of Revive twice during the winter. Um, it's very wet up there, it doesn't, they don't actually get much snow. So she was able to apply it once, I think in October, and then another time in, I think it was probably April, and she put down another application. And then in June, she measured the levels again. Um, in the control, it actually went up where we didn't treat it. And where we did treat it, it went down. So a very interesting uh, phenomena is occurring there. And there's some really fascinating things about arsenic, but I won't get into that. So it was a 17.5% reduction in the treated area. It, Dr. Gardner is a retired database professor. She taught computer programming at University of Washington, I think, for 30 years and retired. So her PhD is in, is in computer science, but she knows how to write. I have the paper that she wrote up and submitted to the state of Washington and said, look what we were able to do in, in this very simple way. And, um, you know, the King County basically said, that's nice. And they did nothing with it, but that's okay. I have the paper and that's part of the package. So you guys can read through all of the research that she found on uh, arsenic in the environment. And, and then also discussing um, the actual measurements and what she did and, and all that. So that's a, it's not peer reviewed or anything, but it's, um, but it's a nice, it's a nice paper and it has some really cool references in it as well. So this is a simple one that um, was, uh, you know, not really simple, but you know, here, second, pretty well documented. So that's that. Now I want to talk about another one. This one's also in the Seattle area, and this is my personal pet project. Uh -huh. The Komodo dragon is one of my favorite animals in the world. These giant lizards that, um, you know, some of them are eight, can get up to eight to 10 feet long, you know, huge monitor lizards. Cool thing about them, and I, I say cool in a really kind of a geeky sort of a way, is that um, their, their hunting strategy is real simple. They have in their mouths, they have flesh eating bacteria live in their mouths. So they walk up to an animal like a wildebeest and they nip it in the ankle. Three days later, that animal is dead and they go eat it. Really disgusting. Um, but it's kind of cool, you know, from a, from a microbiological perspective. Now, the interesting thing though is, is that their poop is also really toxic. 
So, and pretty smelly, you know, lizard poop is, uh, yeah, it's kind of like birds actually. But, um, so at the zoo in Seattle, they have these animals and they had trouble with odor control. They had incredibly high levels of E. coli. And, and this is an ongoing project. We're still, we've been working with them now for 10 years, more than 10 years. They, um, are, uh, they apply provide and revive. They also do, they have their own, uh, compost tea program as well to supplement that, but they use provide and revive to treat the areas. And essentially, you know, this is the really short version of the story, um, only because of time. I want to make sure to leave lots of time for questions too. But, you know, we were able to take it from 100,000 average colony forming units of E. coli down to almost nothing. Um, and maintaining that over the course of the last 10 years, it fluctuates, of course, you know, it, depending on when they test it and how frequently they remember to apply the products into the exhibit. But the odor goes away. The E. coli is a really um, uh, nominal levels, you know, for, for con given the conditions. So, you know, the amount of money that they saved, they, they figured that they've saved over that 10 year period is close to a million dollars just in this one exhibit, just managing this exhibit. Because it used to be pretty labor intensive to clean it up. It's hazmat suits, special disposal fees because it was considered hazardous waste and all that. So when I go to the zoo, they're, they're really happy um, to see me. They give me the special million dollar donor tour because that's how much money we saved them on this exhibit. The thing that's, um, for me, it's really great because it, all the money that they raise, this is a nonprofit, and they raise money for conservation. So all the money that this dragon raises or that we save in maintaining this dragon can go back to Komodo to help with habitat conservation, restoration, and, and preservation. So um, it's kind of fun. Now, we started this project, gosh, yeah, 10 years ago or more. Um, we now, we, they take care of like seven or eight, 10 other exhibits. Um, you know, they doing uh, cats, you know, jaguars and ocelots, and they do goats and monkeys and um, snakes, and I forget what else. There's just like, and then their rose garden. They use it on, they use the products on their rose garden too, because pretty cool. So anyways, that's the short version. I have a write-up on this um, and Katrina is the primary person, it, Katrina Lindahl up there. She is the chief horticulturalist. One of her motivation was that in these exhibits that were um, so kind of contaminated because of the concentration of the animal, is too small a space for the animal, all of her plants were dying. So she's growing out all of these exotic plants in her greenhouse and putting them in the exhibit, and then they all die. Um, so her motivation was really to figure out how to save her plants, and then um, the rest of it was really kind of more of a benefit uh, from that. So anyways, that's a, that's a fun one. If you ever go to Washington Park Zoo in Seattle, um, say hello to the Komodo dragons for me. They're, they're just, they're incredible to, to watch. Um, yeah, now, one last little story. Um, this is work that we've been doing. This one is, has to do with cesium, so it's more of a salt. It's not necessarily a heavy metal or uh, animal contamination kind of a situation, but with the radioactive cesium. And this one, I have the re both research papers um, as well as a write-up from Oregon State University. They did laboratory testing. Uh, de testing the efficacy of the biology of our, of our products to limit the movement of radiation in the environment. Um, we also did some very small scale field trials in Japan. And the bottom line is with this is that we were able to demonstrate that by adding biology, specifically fungi, and, and feeding it and supporting it, we were able to immobilize the radiation in the environment. 
We limited its availability um, to plants, so it can't take it up into the plant as easily, and also um, almost, almost eliminated it from uh, groundwater contamination. Now, the testing is very limited, and like I said, the papers are available for you to look at. I'll make sure that Bree gets those and can distribute them as appropriate. Um, but the, uh, you know, it, it real promising. Now, of course, Japan right now, even though it's not in the news anymore, those reactors are still active and they're still contaminating the environment. But we partnered up with a Japanese company and we're now going into Japan. In fact, my contact here in the States just got back from a trip. And so uh, getting ready to, to do some serious starts at doing more field trials in Japan. Um, as they slowly contain and, you know, the CCM, of course, is, uh, you know, it's got a half-life of about 23 years. So I think one of the things that they're trying to do is drag their toes long enough for it to not be a problem anymore, which is kind of sad because it's a big area. Um, but anyways, really exciting um, way to... Uh, to deal with the radiation without having to necessarily remove all the soil. We can immobilize it, you know, and limit it, its movement in the environment, then let it decay in a natural way. You know, there, the alternate way to do it was to dig up, you know, a, a, a foot or two of soil and, and turn it into glass and store it somewhere else um, at the cost of trillions of dollars, um, maybe even more. <laughs> just a huge cleanup, right? Just huge expenses. So we think we can clean it up at least a lot of the areas, especially on the outer fringes, we can clean that up a lot easier and, and make the environment safer to be in. So anyways, I'm going to now step into talking about a little bit more about the products that I mentioned because, you know, I didn't really talk about them. I just mentioned that we used them. So I'm just going to real quickly talk about our products. Um, Soil Provide is a biological inoculum. It's stable uh, bacteria and fungal components that can be added into a system to help in bring back some biology into a system that may be damaged, introduce some diversity, and help kickstart the, the program with some biology, especially if it's really out of balance or if there's indications that the diversity has been damaged. Um, then the soil revive, which is a critical piece of this as well. This is basically one product in two parts. Soil revive is the food. It's got the humic acid, uh, kelp, complex carbohydrates, protein-based vegetable uh, food source for the biology to eat. So there's, um, so provide adds biology to the system and then revive will help feed the fungi, help feed the protozoa. Also, it has that humic acid component, which can be really helpful in chelating salts and also potentially sequestering, um, helping the sequestration process of heavy metals. So this is part of the reason why I'm not a big fan of removing the soil when we could probably fix it and sequester it and take it out of the, basically take it out of the environment. Um, there's a lot of, a uh, lot of information about the, um, the role of fungi, especially one of my, my personal favorite book that I have, well, I have a few of them, Metal Ions and Fungi is a, is a research, a compilation of research papers that's done over the last almost 60 years studying the effects of fungi on heavy metals, radiation, different types of salts, different types of uh, contaminants. And it turns out that as a bioremediation tool, the fungi is a better option than bacteria only because it tends to be less mobile in the environment. The other key piece to that using fungi as a remediation tool is you have to make sure that you have a lot of diversity. Otherwise, if you create a mushroom, then that mushroom hyper accumulates and animals can eat it and spread it around. That's what they found in Fukushima. They were growing too many mushrooms in the forest 
the pigs were eating it and they were spreading it around. Also, um, some phytoremediation strategies, you know, in Chernobyl, they planted sunflower to pull the radiation out of the ground, but it got into the seed and the birds ate the seed and actually spread it further than if they had just left it alone. Um, so, so that's part of the reason why you want to look at the whole while you're working on the parts and treating the whole, pro fixing problems as opposed to just treating symptoms. So, and um, so just uh, a couple other additional tools. You know, I mentioned vermicompost, of course, compost itself, compost teas. If you're into the do-it-yourself approach to this stuff, then there are a lot of resources and tools. We're experts at composting and compost tea as well as making Provide and Revive available. Um, I recommend organic protein-based fertilizers as opposed to salt or petrochemical fertilizers. Mineral nutrients, so sometimes lime can be a good thing, rock dusts, stuff like that. Um, turns out that a low disturbance regime, and so read no-till or conservation tilling uh, for those of you who are into agriculture, you know, the, the less you can disturb the soil, the more the, the more the biology can really work it. Um, and, you know, you don't have, uh, this, the biology is really susceptible to the disturbance. And again, focus, solve problems, not symptoms. And just um, really try and, you know, think about what it is that you want to accomplish look at as much, get as much information as you can about what you're trying to fix. What is that actual problem? You know, want plants to grow. Okay, what are the things that we need to make sure are working so that those plants will grow? And then, um, you know, and again, it's, there's no one size fits all um, approach. So I was not, I was intentionally vague about what you should do. Um, because it's really dependent on what you're trying to accomplish and what problems you're actually trying to solve. So that's where the testing is really important to know what are you dealing with so that you get the right tool in there and that you don't miss something. You know, because you could try one thing and maybe you missed a piece somewhere along the line. I don't know. So that's, that's my pitch, <laughs> if you will. That's my story. Um, Thank you much for listening. Uh, I have no idea how well this is going to work as far as the questions. Um, you can visit us at earthfort.com. You know, my personal email is right there, Matt at Earthfort. Um, you know, and again, the, uh, the references and research papers and everything that are associated with this work that we've done is, um, is going to be made available. And I think we recorded this session as well. I'm hoping I recorded this session. So, um, you know, you'll be able to come back and watch it again. And uh, yeah, so that is that. So I don't know if, um, let's see. Uh, yep, so I don't know what else there is to look at. Uh, yeah, a little bit. Let me. Probably that little blue line. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, it, you're, you're breaking up a little, but I can hear you. Okay, it might be because my internet is bad. But um, thank you very, very much. And yeah, I just want to say if other people have questions, um, you can unmute yourself. Um, and then go ahead and ask any questions. <laughs> Do you know what you're muted, please? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's see. I, I have a question on in terms of like the amount of product and I know Vernon and I have talked about this um, depending on the goals of the site so if somebody is looking at 
you know, maybe just getting a site um, basically to grow a desirable um, herbaceous layer for like erosion control, that type mm -hmm. of thing, versus if somebody is trying to reestablish um, trees um, right. or shrubs or more mm -hmm. woody species. Um, what are the different like allocation rates or levels that you would recommend for those different types yeah. of yeah. end goals? Sure. So in general terms, um, you're looking at, so if you're doing um, grasses or vegetative materials, then you're looking at like a gallon and a pound per acre, uh, probably two or three times early in the growing cycle just to help things get established. Um, if you're doing erosion, if you have erosion issues, I highly recommend you get organic matter into the system. So that's where a good compost will be really helpful um, because a lot of those erosion issues are due to the lack of organic content. So organic material compost going in along with these products to help stimulate everything can be really helpful. Um, with trees, if you're going back into trees, it, it kind of depends on the trees and, and how you're approaching it. But um, in, uh, again, anywhere from a gallon to a pound an acre, like if you're just putting in, um, you know, pine seedlings, you know, probably I'd do a gallon and a pound a few times early in the growing cycle. If you're going into something a little more complex, like a fir or, um, you know, like a higher level conifer, um, then probably two gallons and two pounds per acre as an initial application at planting and then maybe back off to a gallon and a pound. And then of course, testing can always uh, modify that, you know, based on what's actually going on in the biology. You know, so those are just general kind of recommendations. Um, yeah. Great, thanks. Okay. Anything else? Oh, yeah, Haley had a question. Um, she said, is it better for trees, if you're going into trees, is it better to um, Let's better to dip the roots or apply as a foliar spray. Ah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's that's a really great question. So now you're getting into logistics <laughs> of uh, application. So if you're doing trees, and let's say you're using our products, and then maybe you're doing some mycorrhizal spores as well, then doing a root dip can be a really great way to get everything right on the root system and plant it and then and then maybe the next application would just be over the whole thing as a foliar um you know could be really great way to do it you know in you know logistics is the that's the biggest challenge of the whole thing <laughs> yeah Mm -hmm. Well, must have been thorough. <laughs> um, I want to put out to folks too, because I'm not sure who all um, RSVP'd, um, but um, we do have opportunity um, to trial some of the product that Matt has been talking about. Um, we have some sites identified, but if people are interested, um, please email back to uh, um, the RSVP email that was sent around, um, and we can talk about um, possibilities and just what people's interest is. Yeah. Good. Great. Well, thank you very, very much again. Yeah. Um, and thanks to everybody for joining. And yeah, we'll keep the conversation going forward. Okay.
Well, thank you again for the opportunity to speak and good luck to all of you who are dealing with this, this problem. So hopefully we can help. And yeah, thanks.